Hi and welcome to this presentation on rider fitness is what we've called it and I've called it fitness because that's typically if you search for a rider fitness program fitness is a word that comes up and this is a presentation that I have done for the International Society for Equitation Science on day two of their 2022 conference held at Hartford University and I conducted this practical workshop live in the um, gym in the rider performance gym but I thought I'd record it for people that weren't able to make it so maybe you can learn from the information here. So welcome to today's presentation. As I've said, my name is Dr. Jenny Douglas. I'm a senior lecturer in applied sports sciences at Hartford University, and I'm also the founder and head coach at eventingfit.com, which is an equestrian fitness platform online that aims to bring uh, busy riders, education, and motivation to help them with consistency in their off-course training practice to improve their riding and support ethical equitation. So in terms of the practical workshop plan, obviously this is being delivered online, so there won't be a practical part, but you can feel free to stop your recording at any point and maybe try some of the exercises to follow them along. And then you can always join um, my uh, Instagram or Facebook community. And if you actually want to send me any videos of yourself um, performing these exercises, feel free for a bit of feedback. So we're going to start with thinking about what rider fitness is and then I'm going to talk to you about strength conditioning and then we're going to look at the three areas where strength conditioning can help your riding and typically we always go to section two which is development but actually there are different areas that can actually help us including preparation and recovery so we're going to talk about those a little bit today. Um, so first of all is the preparation section so how we can use our knowledge of physiology and biomechanics to actually help with our imminent riding so activations and warm-up we're then going to look at um, the development of snc uh, so how we can use this to mitigate injury develop capacity and monitor and load your training to support your riding performance and then the third section will be how we can use our knowledge of snc so physiology and biomechanics to support and actually encourage and promote um, enhanced recovery practices. So when we were in the actual live workshop, we had a bit of discussion with the um, delegates about what rider fitness is, and we got quite a, an array of different um, answers. Some of them would be um, core strength. Some of them would, would be so that I can support myself on the horse. But it was it wasn't really there was there's nothing that we could like put a pin in it and say this is what you need to be a better rider it's not well understood and um, there's quite a few of us that have tried to research this but because of the nature of the horse rider dyad and the need for standardization and reliability and repeatability in science it's very difficult to say conclusively that this makes you better at this and therefore we have to lean on the literature and other sports use common sense our knowledge of physiology and biomechanics to understand what will improve performance um, from a common sense perspective so for me when I'm thinking of rider fitness I'm not just thinking of cardiovascular fitness so in terms of your cardiovascular efficiency I'm actually looking at all the components of fitness so that might be mobility flexibility for example so I'm looking at all different areas and I, I suppose the goal for me as a strength conditioning coach is to develop a rider that has the capacity to deal whatever the demand is upon them and to be robust enough to mitigate any injury so they're not going to develop injury or pain. So if we just go back a step and actually just think about what the term strength conditioning is, because a lot of people will hear strength conditioning and think of you know, big beefy weightlifters and that's not necessarily what strength has to mean. It's very independent for the task that we're talking about. And so when I'm thinking of strength and conditioning, really I'm thinking of um how we can enhance muscular strength to deal with the demands that are placed on your body and the physiological demands so we can improve capacity. And so um, the difference, I suppose, between a personal trainer and a strength conditioning coach, although some of those, some people will do both, is that a personal trainer might look after your general health, your general wellness, maybe your aesthetics, whereas a strength and conditioning coach is looking at the exact demands of both the sport you're in and of yourself because that's an important thing to bear in mind and how we can use that information to target performance enhancement not just aesthetic or and that might be part of it um but instead of like just having a sole focus on losing weight for example it it would be more performance targeted and that's why a lot of the training programs are very different to what you might see um 
or what you might have done before if you start on a rider fitness journey. So we know that injury prevalence is really high. We know that pain is really high in riders. There's quite a bit of research that documents that. And the only way to mitigate injury or rehab from in injury is either to deload, deload, so essentially take off the volume because too much volume and not enough capacity is essentially what's causing injury. But in a lot of cases, that that can't happen. There's no time for you to not muck out. You haven't got time for, to not do this. You haven't got time to write. So we can't really reduce the volume very much. Um, and so therefore what we need to do is make you more robust and more capable and the only real way to do that is to purposely uh, train yourself to improve your capacity we know that muscle bone etc is excitable tissue and it will adapt with progressive overload Um, and the key term there is progressive overload and the difference between exercise and training is that when you're doing exercise which by the way is absolutely better than nothing for your body and for your riding you will have no particular plan. So you just kind of think, oh, I might do this exercise video today. I'm going to do that today. I'm going to do this exercise class today, that exercise class tomorrow. And that is so much better than doing nothing. So please don't think that I'm, you know, hating on that style. But at the same time, a training program will have purposeful loading patterns, purposeful progression, so that you are making progressive gains with your strength and with your conditioning which will transfer to the horse because as an excitable tissue it also works the same way in the reverse and you will get atrophy or muscle loss or bone tissue loss when you stop the activity so it's important that a strength conditioning coach is loading you in periods over the year because you can't continue to go up all the time you'll overtrain so we look at different methods of, of loading and our knowledge of physiology and biomechanics to make sure that you're improving so for me, that's the key difference between fitness and training. So let's have a look at how we can use, so section one, how we can use strength conditioning to enhance imminent ride performance. I could and will go into detail on all of these areas, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to give you a brief overview and then keep your eye out um, for more information on each area so you understand them a little bit in more detail but when we're thinking about athletic preparation we're thinking about what we can do in the few preceding hours before performance so it might be before you actually get on your horse it might be before competition it might be before your training program or your actual exercise so when we're thinking about s and c we're looking at areas where we can improve your imminent performance so some of these areas are going to be more important for equestrian activities and more important for others so for example aerobic efficiency really important in endurance sports so using a warm-up or an activation to improve aerobic efficiency is super important in distance runners anything five well any any runners really but certainly 5k and over triathletes cyclists for example because i don't know if you've ever gone for a run before but that first mile is always really difficult and there's a reason for that it takes time for the aerobic enzymes to prime takes time for your body to get to an efficient economical state and so warming up specific warm-ups is really important there uh, for most equestrian athletes your on-horse warm-up will do the job fairly well for that so for us it's thinking about priming the neuromuscular system and muscle activation and injury prevention that is really important uh, for equestrian so let's have a little bit of a look at that so when we're thinking about prep and activation we talk about s and c but s and c just remember so strength conditioning is really just the application of our knowledge of physiology and the application of our knowledge of biomechanics and so within that you can almost integrate some areas of t- uh, psychological preparation because that massively affects your physiology um, and we can think about nutrition because again that's all physiological and we can also think about hydration strategies so what you can see on this table here is a competition anchor and the key term that we want to remember there is anchor because this isn't like a superstitious you must follow this or you won't perform well but competition anchors can really help us just set you know um what happens or reverse engineer what happens before competition and if you do have an anchoring pattern then what you can do is think to yourself no that didn't work that time i'm going to change it and you can just tweak little bits rather than going into every competition or every situation not really knowing what you're doing and it all being a bit complicated so if you think of zero as being time of competition you can work back and the biggest thing i see with riders is one they're not activated so they get on and they're a bit stiff and a bit immobile for the first part of their warm-up and i also see their hydration and nutrition strategy not being particularly good because riders typically from the ones i've worked with anyway don't like to have water sloshing in their stomach when they're riding and they don't like to feel full But at the same time, if you're not hydrated well and you're not um, 
well fed for your competition, you'll have cognitive delays. We know that a 2% de dehydration can cause cognitive delays, reaction time issues can make us underperform. Um, and we know that if we're not well fed, uh, which a lot of riders are not, that we're not going to have the fuel to sustain long-term exercise. Now, if you're competing one five-minute dressage test, maybe this is not too much of a problem. But if you're out eventing or if you're out show jumping and you've got four, three, four horses to compete and you're out there all day, it's really important that you start to think about this because if you're thirsty, it's too late. And if you think about how hydration will affect your riding, if you think about, like at, at the moment of recording this, it's a heat wave in the UK, it was 32 degrees yesterday. And whilst that's not a problem for lots of countries, for us, we're not used to it. And so if you think about on a hot day when you're losing more fluid than normal and you're wearing all your riding attire and your body protector you can and you've got hat on and your boots you know there's not a lot of um, evaporation going on so thermoregulation is something to really consider in equestrian athletes and a loading strategy of water is really important now i appreciate that you don't want to feel full and that might be where your water loading strategy starts to happen the day before and early in the morning so that you can taper it off because when you think about your blood your blood is where part of the water comes in the in the plasma and if you have low blood plasma in your blood you haven't got enough volume to sweat so your thermoregulation is affected and you're going to just get hotter and hotter and so it's really important that you're thinking about your hydration not from oh I need to drink because it's good for me but actually you will not be able to cool as effectively it will affect your concentration so drinking the night before or even on wake up having a bit more than normal before you have to get in the lorry and drive off you know um is really important so uh, something to think about and then also carbohydrates as a population of majority not all female questions we tend to be really carb adverse because we've had a lot of social conditioning around what we should eat but carbohydrates is what's going to fuel you on the day of competition and so it's really important and i've done some seminar recordings with james stanbury who's a sport and exercise nutrition performance um dietitian or registered uh, nutritionist should i say sorry and he has talked a little bit more about like the strategies that you might use in competition so please check them out they're on my youtube page um but it's really important that we have food and that might be again you don't want to eat much in the morning well it might be that we have a carb strategy the night before and then we have some small uh, small snacks to consume in the morning so that you have enough energy but you don't feel full so there's lots of things glucose drinks there's lots of things that we can do to actually just get little bits of fruit juices you know it doesn't have to be oh i have to have porridge in the morning you know if that doesn't suit you there's other things that we can do and then having those in will actually improve your performance so it might seem like actually i'm about talking about nutrition but that is all part of enhancing your physiological performance but the key thing, I suppose, from an actual practical point of view that we're thinking of here is the activation routine. So the activation routine is something that you will do at some point prior to getting on your horse. And this is not something that is commonly practiced with equestrians. I get it. It's a bit embarrassing. It's not commonplace. And that's why it's important to remember that the activation routine can be done up to four hours before you actually compete and still have some positive effects. Obviously, the closer to you're actually riding, the better, but you've got to remember as a rider, you're going to be getting your horse ready, walking the course, etc. etc. So it's not like you're standing still doing nothing. So I think that's important to bear in mind. So if you do an activation routine, like here, I've put it one hour before because a lot of riders I work with will do it in their box, for example. But if you don't want to, you could do it four hours before before you leave from home, and then you could always do it twice if you really want it, um, you know, depending on how much time you have. So the example activation we've got here, I think the key thing with an activation is that it needs to be targeted for your sport, but it also needs to be easy for you to remember and really uncomplicated. So the one I've got here is um, three exercises. I've suggested you do two rounds of 45 seconds of work, 15 seconds of rest. It's a six minute activation, literally no time at all. So if you are thinking, I don't know these exercises, I tried to put a reference up on here for you for the videos so and kind of see how they look. But if you go into my YouTube channel, or to be honest, anyone's YouTube channel and Google the names, you will find the a correct form of how to do them. So the dead bug, the reason I've put that in there is it's really good for identifying if our thoracic spine is tight. So if you can bring your arms overhead and your upper back lifts off the floor and your lower back up lifts off the floor, it's indicative that our core isn't activated and that our thoracic spine is tight. So it's a really good one for you to think, oh, a bit of awareness in the core, a bit of awareness of maybe I need to roll up the thoracic spine a bit more. It's also really good for neuromuscular coordination because you're going to do the contralateral arm and leg. So you're going to do, say, left arm, right leg. 
at the same time. So it really works that sort of left brain, right brain activity. So it's good for coordination. It will also warm up the shoulder capsule and the hip flexors, which is important for riding. And it will also activate the core. So for me, the dead bug is a really lovely um, warm up exercise because we automatically look at it and think, oh, that's a core exercise. But actually, it's going to work total body. Second one is a groin squeeze because obviously we're not supposed to grab on with the groins, but we do use the abductors and the adductors quite a lot. And we do use the groin to support the pelvis quite a lot. And so a groin squeeze can be a really nice pelvic reset, but it can also activate those groins in a way that is going to be similar-ish to your riding. Um, if you don't have any equipment, what you can do is put your knees up against the wall and use your fists. But you could use a yoga block, foam roller, tack like a, bit, a couple of numbers in between so be creative here um and we're just going to squeeze for three to four seconds and then release and then squeeze for three to four seconds and then release and the y cuff um you can do this prone um but you, you can also do it standing bent over and hinged if, if lying on the floor is an issue but essentially you're going to come into a y position bring the arms i know you can't really see me on the video but i feel weird not not doing it while I'm talking about it. Bring the arms with the pup, with the fingers to touch behind the body, and then all the way back out again. And that's really good for scapular activation, shoulder range, and mobility, and warming up the posterior chain. Because as as you do it, you will actually be activating glutes, lower back, and core at the same time. So really nice and simple. And this is one example of seven billion that we could give. But just having something that you could do, da -da -da -da, six minutes and we're done. So it doesn't have to be complicated. So I think the biggest thing I'd say here is it doesn't have to be complicated. It certainly doesn't have to change. And once you get into a nice routine, you'll be able to do it without thinking about it. And you'll be able to do it you know, at home before you leave for the yard. And then when you get to the yard, you can get on your horse and concentrate on the aerobic efficiency and concentrate on your horse. And we discussed, you know, quite a lot of us were having a discussion about, well, we don't really do this, but as you do start to get older, you can't get away with it as much. You know, your hips would be tighter. You know, the more horses you're riding, you could do this, you, a, a, a bit of mobility in between. So it's really important if you can get it into your practice, it will, it will improve your performance. It absolutely will. It will, it will improve your efficiency and it will decrease your risk of injury. So let's move on to section two, which is our development this is what most people think of with a with a development i suppose in terms of what fitness is and this is how we can use snc to improve your physical capacity and enhance your performance and mitigate injury development so the images you see here are riders i have worked with and you can see significant improvements in posture and yes there's still postural and positional um, issues in in the afters but we were safer, we were performing at higher levels and we were not falling off as regularly, especially for the jumping person. And so I think it's important to have a think about, um, you know, that there are actually, that although there's not a lot of research that is supporting this at the moment, there's a lot of anecdote and a lot of practice that is supportive that people feel more stable in the saddle, they feel in less pain, they don't get so much um, injury development. And so that's something we're working on in the academics and we're always catching up with practice, aren't we? But there are things that we can do. And this section is particularly complicated. We have two entire degrees that focus on this. So it's a whistle-stop tour, but like I said, I will go into more information in the future. So when we're thinking about athlete preparation, what we're trying to do is mitigate injury so either correct injury once you finish working with a physio and you move on to your S&C coach. So we're trying to make you more uh, robust in the areas that you weren't before, or we're trying to prevent them based on known common areas that equestrians uh, tend to get injured. So what your strength conditioning coach would do before they work with you is a thorough needs analysis. And that means we would look at the biomechanical, physiological and injury demands of that sport. Now I have a pretty good understanding of the, demands of equestrian sport because that's what I research and work in but if I was going to go work with a I don't know Formula One driver I'd have to go and do a bit of research into what the demands are so that I could tailor the program for them we would then look at injury so we know for example a lot of riders are round shouldered lots of tight hip flexors we know that they tend to have weak glutes weak hamstrings so they we know they develop a lot of lower back pain knee pain sometimes elbow pain so we can kind of look at the literature and come up with a sensible sort of areas where we needed to be more robust and then most importantly, you. And this is the part that prospective clients find the hardest because they want to know how many times a week should I train or what exercises should I do? And that is so, there is, there is no exercise that is good for a rider, right? Let's just get that straight. There is no five exercises that's going to make your lower leg do this or three exercises that's going to make your, strong, your core stronger. It's a load of nonsense marketing. The only thing 
that we, we need to know is your functional capacity right now, your postural capacity right now, how you move, your training history, your age, and the total volume on your body. What I would prescribe for a rider that rides once a week at a riding school is going to be massively different to what I would prescribe for an event rider that's riding eight horses, nine horses a day, and competing two, three times a week with multiple horses. Um, those exercises are not going to be the same for those two people. Similar, perhaps, but they're certainly not the same. So I would look at your age, your training history, your psychological motivation, what type of coaching you need, what you enjoy, how much equipment you have, your, how much time you have. Because I could write the best program in the world, but if I can't get you to do it, it doesn't work for your lifestyle. It's not going to have any benefit anyway. So all those things are really important. And that's why it's very difficult as somebody who's trying to influence the equestrian industry to tell you what the best thing to do is, because I need to work with you individually to know that. Uh, to be honest and so we do our best to paint a good picture of what the types of things you would need to do are but the question fitness isn't a blueprint that you just go and follow it's very independent but once we know all that information we can write your program that will enhance your performance because we will make you more robust and have more capacity in the areas that you currently lack and then it will help with enhanced recovery because you will be physiologically uh, fitter you will be able to tolerate higher levels of uh, fatigue metabolites you will be able to ride for longer without a sustaining injury or enduring fatigue so all good news so some common problems i see with equestrian athletes is rounded shoulders and collapsed waists and let's be honest this is quite common in the general population in i'm sitting here right now with round shoulders thinking about it so um rounded shoulders are really common because we right we computer we sit in the car we sit in the lorry we sit on the horse and so our lifestyles are very anterior right and we also then get really tight hip flexors because we're in this sort of curled over position a lot especially as riders so we tend to have as a population a weak mid back with a mobile t-spine so we tend to be quite fixed because our sport requires us to be quite fixed right i know what you're going to say no you don't shouldn't be fixed but you know what i mean like compared to other sports where they have big ranges of motion, ours is relatively limited. So we get an immobile tight spine, tight traps, tight pecs, tight in the lower back, tight in the hip flexors. But then to marry that, we have weak mid back. So our pull mechanics are really off. Uh, um, we have a weak core and weak glutes. So essentially the whole of the back of our body is actually quite weak comparatively to the tight areas. So what we might do is, if you were able to do some sort of 3D biomechanical assessment, which um, my colleague Dr Celeste Wilkins does, you might, and this is um, on the day when we were actually at ISIS Live, we had parallel um, sessions. So it, you could use information like that to see if you had posterior anterior pos uh, pelvic tilt, to see if you had any asymmetries in your upper lower body, and then we could use that to inform the writing of your programme. However, a lot of the time we don't have that information, so we can assess your movements using something known as a functional movement screen. Sometimes I don't even make them this technical, I might literally just look at you in a squat, a bird dog and a lunge, and usually those sort of patterns that you exhibit on the ground transfer to your riding. Um, and certainly to how you move in the gym. So I like to look at a squat. It tells me a lot about your thoracic spine. It tells me a lot about your hips. It tells me a lot about your ankles. And it gives me a good awareness, you know, of, of where you are with your movement and your function. And the lunge is really great for balance. Um, it tells me a lot about the posterior chain as well. So I like to look at those movements. So what we did in the practical days, we had a bit of a look at each other. So this work might be where you could pause the video and and have a look at each other or yourself should I say send a video over but with the squat typically the things I see is that the knees cave in or that people can't um, control their trunk uh, movement plans they have quite a, a lower trunk um, and other things I see with the lunge quite typically is I see them pitching at the hip so the collapsing at the waist to the side losing balance and also knees caving in so that tells us a lot about how you move and then it will help us to decide where we program for you what type of exercise we do because if you're really wobbly in the lunge I'm certainly not going to start getting you to do complicated single leg exercises uh, and this is where um, we had a bit of a discussion about balance and BOSU balls and things and Every single piece of training equipment has its place, but most, and I would say at least 95% of the riders I work with, are, are still able to develop more functional balance without those types of equipment. So I'm not saying that they're bad, I'm just saying that most people don't need them 
and we can get back to discussion later. The good news is with appropriate strength conditioning, you can fix position. So this is the same rider you saw before. And what we can do is focus on mobilizing the areas that are tight. So the T-spine, the pecs, the traps, the lower back and the hip flexors, but at the same time, strengthen the areas that are not actually holding that person in position currently. So the mid back, the glutes and the core. Uh, and, and we would obviously holistically train other areas as well, but those are sort of areas that are out of sync. And your strength conditioning program would be for this person purposefully a little bit loaded on the pull mechanism because we want to correct where the strength discrepancy is so your strength and conditioning coach might purposely offset your training program a little bit to accelerate areas that need strengthening so for example there are some key movement patterns that we look at as strength and conditioning coaches that we use to improve function so you're not going to see any pretend riding from me in the gym and um, that's not what the gym is about I'm, I'm not trying to make you a better rider I'm not trying to coach your riding I'm not trying to mimic what you do on the horse you do enough of that on the horse so you're not going to see any sort of riding looking exercises coming from me what I'm looking at is your functional movement patterns so these include your squat patterns so when you're squatting down your hinge patterns so if you imagine this is your lower body and this is your upper body can you hinge at the hips can you isolate the hamstrings I'm also going to be looking at pull and push movements both in a vertical and a horizontal plane and I'm also going to be looking at core strength from an anti-flexion extension so forward back and an anti-rotation perspective so aesthetics are out of the question here although you will if you train athletically look more athletic we're not looking at what you look like we're looking at how you perform so this is just an example session guys the sessions are going to depend on the equipment you have how advanced you are with your training <laughs> but essentially what I'm trying to get at is the exercises that we would program would be focused on a case study so if these exercises would be perfect for that rider the exercises I prescribe for you or for someone else might look similar to this but they might be slightly different so for example instead of a goblet squat I might do a body weight um, chair squat so that you're just getting used to getting to depth it might be instead of a lunge that I'm getting you to do a split squat so you're not having to move because if balance is a problem I want to work on the function and the range before that instead of a bent over row it might be that I do oh, I've got band pull parts in there it might be that we do some other so it might be do that we just do a, a T hold so we hold our arms out and, and get the um, endurance that way so that there's lots of other things but essentially the way that I would structure a session is Usually total body, not always, but usually because you ride with your total body. You know, you don't need to do glutes and arms and shoulders and back. That's kind of a bodybuilder's approach. Very aesthetic approach to training. When we're training athletically, usually, not always, I would do a total body. It also reduces the load on each area. So you're not always as tired in one particular area. You know, you don't wake up really sore in one area. Um, so I have quite a few example sessions on my YouTube channel and I have some free programs. So if that's of interest to you, please reach out. But here's an exercise. And again, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know what that is, I don't know what that exercise is. Obviously, these are what we went through in the actual workshop live. So feel free to have a pop onto my YouTube channel. All of those exercises will be there available for you to have a look at. Um, but this is how we would program. So the program is specifically looking at, you know, at the top we have the, the squat pattern which is a functional movement pattern I've then moved into an accessory squat pattern which is a lunge so single leg single leg massively important for core strength massively important for balance really good for single leg uh, independence which we need in the saddle the reason I've put a single arm bent over row there is because when you work anything single arm it really isolates the anti-rotation of the core so a lot of riders are really focused on core core strength core stability those terms are really arbitrary if you actually look at the literature on what core strength is it's very difficult to define and so you can get a lot of activation in the core without actually doing any core specific exercises. So single arm, single leg exercises are really good and, and heavy exercises. So starting to um, move towards heavier weights is a really good way of, of training the core. So you might think, oh, there's not much core in there, but actually the single arm bent over in the lunge and the squat, it's all going to work your core. Then we have a band pull apart because that can help correct round shoulder position and help with mid back strength. So you've got two pull exercises there. 
So sometimes if someone's got really correct body position, I might put a push and a pull. But here I've put two pulls because the person has enough push going on. They don't need any more tightness there. And then I've put the dead bug for all the reasons I explained in the uh, warm up. It's great for uh, opening up the thoracic spine, the shoulder capsule, the hip flexors, core isolation. And then I've put a Copenhagen plank in. Now, if you are new to training, I wouldn't put a Copenhagen plank in. If you have a look at my YouTube, Copenhagen plank is when you have one knee. It's like a side plank, basically, but with one knee raised and then the lower leg lifted. So you're kind of suspended. And that's really good for groin strength, um, pelvic strength, um, oblique strength, shoulder strength. So really great. But again, that's not necessarily what I prescribe for a beginner. But for this rider, uh, this is what we prescribe for her. It was really good. So... That's just an example. I could write 77 different types of ones that would be equally as good. Um, and so it's just an idea of how I, I kind of wanted you to see the logic behind this is the problem, this is the fix, and this is how we program for it. At this point, quite a few people ask me how many sessions, how many. That depends on you. Like I have some event riders in the season that will do two lots of 20 minute activation and mobility. And then they're off season, three to four heavy strength training sessions and some conditioning. It, it depends. It's, it depends so much. And it also depends on the metrics. Like if I'm training you twice a week and we're seeing no improvement, we might have to rethink that a little bit. But I think it's important to remember that this is supposed to be supplementary to and additional to your riding. It's not in place of. And so even some of the best rugby teams will train strength train two, three times a week. They do obviously their other bits whilst they're on, on the field, but that's their equivalent to your riding. So even high level athletes it, it's not sort of something unless you're like a bodybuilder or really working your aesthetics there's no real need to lift weights five six times a week um and i think because we have that social conditioning that that's what we need to do we think that's what we need to do to be successful it's absolutely not also training doesn't have to make you so sore every single time that you can't move and that's a big put off for a lot of people that is a marketing social media myth if you feel sore you feel like you've done something if you feel sweaty you feel like you've done something that's that's not always how you train for performance. That's sort of like missold aesthetic kind of nonsense, if I'm honest. And if you like getting sweaty, that's fine. I do too. But you just have to remember, not every session has to leave you puffing and huffing and not every session has to leave you feeling sore. That it's not indicative of a good workout. And once you start to get your head around that, actually exercise can become more enjoyable because you could do your session and you can leave and go straight to the yard and you're not like dying. I mean, don't get me wrong, you should work hard, but it doesn't have to be, you know, that kind of sweating everywhere, sore, barely lie on the floor, can barely move. That's not necessarily what um, training for performance is all the time. So lastly, uh, recovery. How can we use strength and conditioning to improve our recovery ready for the next ride? Well, first of all, let's talk about conditioning to remove fatigue. Now, this might not be as important for riders. Maybe if you're on the endurance rider or maybe if you're on the cross-country course, um, potentially some show jumpers. But think of some other sports, you know, like a Tour de France rider, for example. They ride six hours a day and then the first thing they do is get off and hop on a turbo and flush it out. So it's really important, both for your horses and for you, that you have a bit of a, a flush afterwards. So it doesn't, you know, for you it might just be walking to go and get a drink or, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be massively intense depending on how intense the exercise was. But it's important to remember to do some sort of conditioning flush to get rid of the toxins after our exercise. So you don't just stop and do nothing. It's also really important to return our muscles to full length and range of motion, especially as riders. Like I said, we're in quite an isolated position. We don't do have a lot of range. If you don't train off your horse, you probably don't actually work your joints to their full range very often so it's really important that we do that return the muscles to full length and range of motion both after a session and between sessions and I think for a lot of people that's the hardest bit it certainly is for me because it's just another thing to do isn't it so if you read the book by James Clear um, Atomic Habits he talks about habit stacking and we talked about, about this at a point if you could find something you already do every day and then just add something to it so it might be that you watch a tv program at 9 p.m and you sit there and watch it, well, that could be when you start to stack your mobility onto it. And it doesn't have to be more than five or ten minutes if you do it regularly. Um, so trying to think about that. Um, I can't stress enough how important regular hydration, nutrition, sleep and stress management is. Um, I have a course called Train Like a Pro, and in there we talk about physiological mechanisms behind training and recovery. But um, essentially stress is stress. Your body doesn't think, oh, this is physical stress. Oh, this is psychological stress. Oh, it doesn't process it like that so 
it's really important that if you want to perform well, you manage everything else around that. So a good S&C coach would be looking, because that all affects your physiology. So a good S&C coach will also be looking to manage those things in and around your training. And then what you probably won't see necessarily is your trainer monitoring the load and the tapering of your programme. So like I've already alluded to, I'll have one rider doing lots and lots in her off season, but in her in season, it needs to calm down. You can't tolerate the load of all that riding and competing and the S&C as well. And I think we have to recognise that this is, Second to you're right, you know, it's, it's not the most important thing, unlike some other sports where it is, you know, like cycling, triathlon, but literally the training is the most important thing. Like it, it depends, whereas with our sport, it's more skill based, it's certainly not. It's important, but it's certainly not number one. And I think it's important to bear that in mind. But you can't, like I said, you can't just keep going up and up and up. You have to taper, you have to monitor. So it might be that you do three weeks of progressive overload and then you have a week of a deload or it might be that you deload into a competition or you deload in your off in your in season so it's really important that you recognize that a good strength conditioning coach is actually adapting the program behind the scenes and um, ask questions so you understand it a bit more so an example of recovery might be promotion of blood flow so conditioning flush and then for this rider, um, the example that we had, she needed to mobilise her thoracic spine, she needed to mobilise her hips, she needed to mobilise her glutes, and she also needed to do some mobility on her traps and her pecs. So this is just an example. Like I said, for this case study that we've used, you could do 100 different thousand recoveries and that would be fine. But again, the same thing with the activation, having something that you just know how to do. And that is kind of like a flow. So you go from one to the next one to the next. And you don't need billions of bits of equipment is what's going to allow you to do it regularly. So I've put here a cat cow and I've just put a minute here. But really, there's no end of how much time you could spend doing your mobility. So I've put a cat cow um, for the thoracic spine. I've put a kneeling hip flexor stretch on each side. I've put a figure four stretch for the piriformis and the glutes. And then I've put if you get a lacrosse ball or a massage ball, you can do a pet release and you can do it by hand you can do it by leaning on the wall lying on the floor it depends how much pain you can tolerate and then you can do what's known as a trap release or a trap smash and you can put like a ball tennis ball lacrosse ball apple whatever and you can put it into your traps and either get somebody to do it for you or you can lean against the wall and really dig into your traps like that and doing that regularly will help to mobilize the areas that are stiff because there's no point in mobilizing those areas without strengthening the other areas up and there's no point in strengthening the other areas up without mobilizing the areas tight so it's holistic and it's how we can get all those areas into you regularly and if we're able to do it in a way that is non-complicated and easy then you're more likely to adhere to it generally speaking the rule of thumb is before you ride or train the exercises should be dynamic and afterwards they can be or more static so in summary the athletic principles of, of training or the athletic preparation principles are the key, key ones are progression. If you're always just doing random exercises that don't have any progression, and this includes your yoga and your Pilates, um, you're going to get stale and you're not going to progress and you're going to see plateaus. So it's really important that whilst exercising is good, so if you're the type of person that just goes on YouTube and picks up a Joey Wicks video or picks up a random you know, yoga video, that is so much better than nothing. Absolutely. But if you're looking to, if you've done some training for a while and you're not really seeing any gains, um, or performance improvements or aesthetic improvements and it's probably because you're not progressively loading you sort of staled out so it's really important we do that consistency is king twice a week for 50 or 48 weeks of the year shall I say is so much better than a manic 12-week block um, that said I do promote a 12-week program because it helps with consistency but the goal is the long term after that the common, common barriers I receive from riders is time and it's really important you are time busy you do have a lot going on. Your strength conditioning coach needs to be effective with their training and mindful of your time barriers. You also need to have a plan. Most of my riders that don't have a plan, they fart around not knowing what to do. They don't know whether to watch this video, that video. They get confused. They don't know what to do. They don't know what exercises they're doing. And then they end up not exercising because the whole mental load of it is far too difficult. Nutrition is a big one, especially if weight loss is one of your goals. And by the way, it's absolutely fine to have aesthetic goals. I have them. Other people have them. Um, uh, from a weight perspective in terms of ethical expectation but also for your general health but also from fueling for competition and performance nutrition is a, is a barrier 
Um, our lifestyles as riders tend to be very one-sided and anterior because of the tasks we include. So that's something we need to consider when we're designing training programs. And lastly, I've put here mindset because our self-sabotage or our limitations, our fears, the narrative we tell ourselves about strength and conditioning stops us um, in our tracks before we've even had the chance to be successful. So I would ask you to just consider what you've learned from this practical presentation and maybe some things that you can incorporate into your practice going forward. And then lastly, a shameless non shameless plug. This is the sort of thing we do best here at eventingfit.com. We design you athletic specific strength and conditioning uh, programs from home. So you can do them from anywhere in the world. We also have podcasts, webinars, blog posts, all sorts of information aimed to help to educate you and make the narrative a little easier for you because you are time poor and you do need to have the information like that so that you can actually execute it because the best program in the world is the one that's done consistently. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. I appreciate the time if you've got this far. If you need any information from me, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach me on info at eventingfit.com at any time or you can follow me on socials and I'll make sure to get back to you if you message me there. Thanks again, guys. As I said, this is a whistle stop tour, so look forward to more information on each section in detail in the near future.